Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to find a non-violent solution, whereas Malcolm X was willing to do whatever means necessary to obtain equal voting rights. of our nation in the area of civil rights. I might say that in the very beginning, I congratulated the president for the passage of the new voting bill, knowing that he had worked so passionately and unrelentingly uh, for this bill and made it very clear to him uh, that this would uh, be a great step forward in removing all of the remaining obstacles to the right to vote. President Johnson asked me to come in mainly to uh, discuss the pending conference that will come up in the fall on the civil rights. Uh, he is very concerned about making this an in-depth conference uh, to grapple with the depths and dimensions of the problem of racial injustice in our country and he wants us to emerge from this conference with concrete positive uh, recommendations so that in the future we will be able to grapple with this problem in a more profound way. He asked for my suggestions and my recommendations and uh, I said to him that as soon as possible I would be submitting these recommendations uh, to him. After a look into Malcolm's early childhood, understanding his drive for erasing white supremacy and will to fight for desegregation becomes clear. At the premature age of just six, Malcolm's father was found dead on trolley tracks, and although it was ruled accidental, Malcolm believed it was the work of white supremacists. This incident, along with his mother being institutionalized, demotivated Malcolm's educational drive. He would later drop out of school and become a petty thief. At a point in his life, however, he was jailed 10 years for burglary and began to self-educate. When his brother came to visit, he immersed himself into the nation of Islam's teachings. The practice of the NOI brought forth the idea that the African heritage was superior to all others. After years, Malcolm would rise rapidly in the rankings of the NOI and he would become the minister of the Boston Temple No. 11, which he founded. Malcolm was an articulate public speaker and had a charismatic personality. He would often express his pent-up anger and the bitterness of African Americans during the major phase of the Civil Rights Movement, from 1955 to 1965. Malcolm's ardent radicalism made him a formidable critic of American society and he would often criticize the mainstream civil rights movement. He challenged Martin Luther King Jr.'s central notion of integration and nonviolent protest. Malcolm believed there was more at stake than for young African Americans to be sitting in a restaurant. He believed black identity and integrity were more concerning matters. Malcolm's radicalism and thought that black identity and integrity were issues far too big to be fought for nonviolently led to one of his most well-known speeches, the ballot or the bullet. The speech was given on April 3, 1964 at Corey Methodist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. In the speech, Malcolm encouraged black Americans to join organizations such as the NAACP and CORE. Malcolm wanted his followers to spread black nationalism and bring awareness to the problems which affected blacks at the time. The central idea of the speech was to encourage oppressed blacks to fight the oppression of the white man by means of the ballot or the bullet. Malcolm's win by any means mindset gave no care to the risk of the use of violence in order to obtain equality. His speech, the ballot or the bullet, displayed this. Malcolm was willing to vote for equality, but if necessary, he was also willing to take arms. Malcolm's willingness to take arms is one of his characteristics which contrasts to MLK completely. You and I have to look at this and understand this, that the ballot is as powerful as the bullet. We want to make them pass the strongest civil rights bill they've ever passed. Because we know even after they pass it, they can't enforce it. This is American justice. This is American democracy. And those of you who are familiar with it know that in America, democracy is hypocrisy. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal.
As the son and grandson of preachers, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was raised in a Christian home that taught of brotherly love and love your enemies theology. Later, as a graduate student, MLK wrestled with the works of famed philosophers and theologians trying to apply their teachings to the matters of injustice and how the black church should be used for social change. However, this philosophy did not originally appeal to King. Years later, King attended a lecture on the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. This is where King first heard of Satyagraha, or soul force. This is the force of love and truth combined. MLK immediately thought that this could be used to improve the race relations in America. He immediately bought six books by Gandhi. He soon found out that Gandhi believed that, quote, strikes, boycotts, and protests, marches, all conducted nonviolently and all predicated on love for the oppressor and in belief in divine justice, unquote. King believed that Gandhi had found the perfect blueprint for a minority to rise up against its oppressor. This outline would push and empower MLK for the turbulent years ahead. At the age of 26, King was preaching at Montgomery Baptist Church when a young member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Rosa Parks, refused to go for seat on a bus for a white man. Black Trailblazers called for a bus boycott and King rose up to become the leader of the newly formed Montgomery Improvement Association, MIA. At first reluctant, King accepted. However, he was met with many death threats. One day, while sitting at his counter, King believed he had heard the voice of God telling him to continue. Three days later, King's house was firebombed, but he did not give in to violence, keeping his pledge for peace and stating, we will have an attitude of love. Within a year, the Supreme Court ruled that segregated buses were unlawful. In 1963, MLK was arrested and imprisoned for joining the march in Birmingham. From the cell, King sent a letter to white ministers who called him a troublemaker and accused him of stirring up violence. Drawing from his years of theological and philosophical study, King wrote a letter about Christians and their obligation to promote social change. Inspired, King's followers marched to the jail. When met with violence from the police, the protesters remained peaceful. This finally persuaded John F. Kennedy to propose a new Civil Rights Act. But the fight chugged on. On August 18, 1963, MLK and 250,000 other civil rights activists gathered on the Washington Mall. The leaders of the movement took turns speaking, with MLK speaking last. He spoke a message condemning the current leaders for failing to honor promises made by the Founding Fathers. Shifting gears, Martin went from judgment to biblical visionary. It was here that he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. He laid down his vision of social justice and equality, and the White House listened. Within a year, President London Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into effect, but King Five years later, on April 3rd, King gave a speech to support black sanitation workers striking. The next day, he was assassinated by a KKK member named James Olray.